Yeah. No, I'm ready. You're ready. Okay. All right. Whenever you're ready, go. Hi, I'm Jamie B. Haas from Jamie B. Haas, and I'm here with Jeff Smith from Vroom Vroom Veer. Well done. You could be on rock and roll radio already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hit stop. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur jeff smith hey leg top thank you so much for being on vroom vroom Veer, and welcome to the show how's it going thanks for having me jeff it's really nice to be here okay well we've already yeah, we've already started having fun <laughs> <laughs> and we're uh, we're kind of in a vibe already, so that's awesome. So you started the school of created creative high growth. So talk yes. a little bit about what you're most excited about at the school today. <laughs> uh, well, the school has uh, come to fruition this year officially. Okay, but the work that has uh, that's been uh, been taught. Through the through the school has been going on for the last fifteen years. Wow! Uh, I'm excited to take all the work and put it in in an entity that is more of a formal way to present the work into the world. Uh, have a faculty have nice. an ability to really grow the work beyond just you, me, myself, and I. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, something that might live beyond you, maybe. Yeah, Let's yeah. Hope. I'm at the age that I'm starting to think <laughs> legacy. Right. Legacy, you know. Exactly. What what right. do I leave behind? And there you go. this year, I don't know. I think turning 55 kind of uh, mm. hit me. Congratulations! Hit me more than when 50 hit me, <laughs> it's a big number, isn't it? It's yeah, like for I'm some reason, 55. Now, like, I'm past half. There's not many people yeah. that get to 110. You know. <laughs> yeah, there's 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 this ur in, inner urgency uh, uh, about uh, interesting uh, or, around. Okay. Making a bigger difference and leaving a legacy behind. And that seems to be taking the lead on all my decisions and choices. Okay. I like it. That's pretty awesome. Good for you. It's nice to have something other than just like a stone. <laughs> and if it's on the internet, right? You know what they say yeah. about stuff on the internet? It's like pee in the pool. It's not going anywhere. It's not, it's not coming out, right? So exactly. once a thing is out there in the internet, as long as there's humans, it's out there. It's forever, yes. It's well, the idea. Yeah, well, nothing's forever, but, you know, I digress. Okay, so later on, we're going to talk about the, that one time you took two years off and you traveled the world, and that sounds awesome. So we're going to... We're not going to talk about that yet. First, we have to go back in time and okay. <clears throat> talk about, like, where did you grow up? Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Israel. I was born in wow. uh, Tel Aviv. Okay. Um, and uh, lived there until I was 15. Right. Okay. And when I was 15, uh, my, my parents uh, decided to immigrate to the American dream. Right. And uh, <laughs> bring me and my brothers uh, to this beautiful country. Right. And... Uh, uh, we moved to Los Angeles. Nice. And that's where it became home for the next uh, 30 plus years. Wow. I had an okay. amazing career there, a marriage, a lot of uh, ama amazing friends. and You had a whole family life. still there. Yeah. Wow. I had a whole life. Yeah. A whole life. I'm on part, uh, a part three right now, as I call it. You know, part <laughs> one was Israel. Right. Part two was LA. Yeah. And part three has started about almost five years ago when I moved to Santa Fe in New, in New Mexico. Ooh, I so love it's a very Santa different Fe. vibe. Oh man. Thank you. Yeah, Artist yeah, colony. Yeah, I live, I live, I live and... in the outskirts of Santa Fe in a um, neighborhood called El Dorado, which is mm, um, just wow. desert and country and nothing yeah. but mountains and big skies. Yeah. It's yeah. It's gorgeous. I, yeah. So I had a buddy who lived in, uh, lived and worked in Albuquerque. So mm -hmm. Santa Fe is not that long of a uh, far of a drive. Mm, it's about an hour drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We not zipped long. out there for food, and there was a bike mm -hmm. race, and yeah, it's a 
So good for you. That's that I I would consider Santa Fe a win. <laughs> Me too. Me yeah, too. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So do they have yeah. like hot springs around there? Like can, uh yeah. Can, yeah, yeah, you can, we, right? We have, okay. We have so much. It's there's it's an incredibly abundant place. Mm. Mm. I need yeah. to get back to Santa Fe. Okay. Everyone does. <laughs> I, yeah, all right. New Mexico in general is awesome. Okay. Yeah, there's something about the energy of this place that is um, undescribable. I, I've been around the world mm. and ended up choosing this place because of the energy and the wow. sky. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my wife, she's from Japan. So Japanese people really dig the, you know, the hot bath, the natural hot spring bath. Yeah. So that's one of the few places in the U.S. that you can find right. really nice. <laughs> Maybe not necessarily yeah. Santa Fe, but New Mexico. I know there's like a, around White Sands, there's a lot. There's actually mm -hmm. a, a, a city called Hot Springs, I think. <laughs> Somewhere in New Mexico. We have a Japanese spa here in, in Santa Fe called 10,000 Waves that has springs, Ooh. baths, and it's yeah. an amazing Amazing place to visit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we picked, uh, so. I, I was going to say, I'm on chapter I don't know how many because I lost count. <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd have to do the count in my head. But, you know, when okay. you're in the military, right, every three years you get to move. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if, like, your, t if your life is sort of like a TV show and every move is a season, I'm on, like, I don't know, season nine maybe. I kind of lost count. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, that's a lot of change. It is. It's awesome. You know, yeah. you know, when people say to me like, wow, you were in the Air Force 20 years. That's a long time for one job. It doesn't feel like one job. Right. Yeah. Every every base, every assignment has like a feel to it. But then you're also like you get a job within those three years and a different job within those three years. And then you might go to the desert or you might, you know. Yeah go here, go here, you know, for a school or anyway, it was awesome. Sounds like an adventurous <laughs> life. Yes, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> okay. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about what it was like growing up in Tel Aviv, just a smidge. I know you don't like talking about the past, a but smidge, a smidge. <laughs> I, yeah. Just, a, it, just give us a flavor of how contrast that to what you know, it must've been like a big sh culture shock moving from Tel Aviv to L.A. at 15? It was and it wasn't. Uh, okay. Um, it, it was a, a bit of a shock because, yes, it is a completely different culture. You're talking me Middle East. Right, right. Um, in the 1970s, you know, yeah, a yeah. fairly new country right. uh, that is just kind of figuring out who she is. Right. Um, with not many resources like uh, the states have. Right. Um, but my dad um, used to work as an uh, airplane mechanic for El Al Airlines at the time. Oh, wow. And uh, because he worked for the airline, we got perks. Sure. You and did. we got to fly to America. And um, when I was a kid, I think the, I was, uh, I want to say, nine years old, I came to the States for the first time for the summer. And we stayed in LA and New York. And I got a sense of what being in America is about. Uh, at that point, I didn't even ever even thought about the idea of uh, living here. It was not even on the radar at the time. Right. So come, going to America for the holiday was was kind of like going to Disneyland <laughs> on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> and we would go it. to Disneyland, and that was just amazing, too. All right, know, so. right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just like it's suddenly the world seems much, much bigger, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when we moved here, the, the contrast uh, wasn't that stark because I had... You had a taste the, already. I had, yeah. I had a taste of it, exactly. exactly. And by the time I came here, um, I also spoke English already. So the okay. language barrier was not that there for me. So it, I think it was actually a fairly smooth transition. Uh, gotcha. Consi considering um, all the factors that are in place. Okay. No, I get it. Yeah. So did... Um, but growing up in Israel, you asked me what was that, what was that like? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the first word that came up for me was traumatic. <laughs> really? It was it was scary, traumatic. Well, traumatic or scary. You, I was born in 1967, and between 67 gotcha. and 73, okay, that which was 67, there was a war, and 73, there was a war. Wow. So I lived in the shadow of a war. 
in a country that is continuously on um, high alert, and uh, mm. it hasn't changed much uh, since in many ways, mm. but the the energy that uh, we lived in, uh, now that I can look back and, and really reflect on those years, the energy that we lived in was a hostile energy, and it right. was a survival energy. Mm. So... Yes, there was a lot of trauma uh, surrounded with it because that's the that's the reality that we're living in. Everybody's going through this trauma, right? <clears throat> and it was amazing as well because I was gifted with the opportunity to learn so much, lo- so much about the world and about life and about language. You know, I speak Hebrew, read and re- read and uh, write it fluently, and it's, I feel like it's such a gift that I have another language that yeah. I can uh, wow. uh, communicate in. So right. um, a lot of gifts came out of that, out of that period, as traumatic as it was. Yeah. Wow. So when, when you, when you lived in LA, then um, LA can be scary, but did you, did it feel like less threatening? I, it had to, right? Oh Yeah. Oh yeah. Night and day. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. So what part it's of yeah, the land ahead. of the free. <laughs> sure. Sure. Isn't sure. it? <laughs> yeah. And you're not like um I would imagine like just like what was a typical day if something scary happened in Tel Aviv? Was it like a bomb squad or so uh, like, yeah, a terrorist like a bombing, attack terrorist or, attack, or, right? Uh, okay. War, bombing. I mean, gotcha. I have some clear memories as a kid of my mother grabbing me and my brother and running to the bomb shelter down uh, in the basement, you know. Wow. Those moments are, are, are there, you yeah. know, but it's not the everyday reality, you know. it's Right. It's just like, oh, it's almost like a, you, you treat it like weather, right? Like, oh, I just yeah. heard on the news that there's, yeah. a, there's a tornado warning. We have to get in the basement. But that's instead a, that's of that, a great way to describe it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you, you're you, you're you're living in in a sense of there's an expectation that something might happen at any time. So right. we're always prepared and ready and on alert, mm. and uh, we just move through life. Right. So were yeah. you in, still in L.A. Uh, during the Rodney King situation? Because yeah, my wife was eighty three. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So and my I, wife I was, was there. Like, <laughs> I was there okay. downtown the night Down, of the riots, man. Really? Yeah. Oh, I, I wow, did, we did, I went to a concert to see Sarah McLaughlin. Oh, Sarah McLaughlin. <laughs> oh, she's awesome. I do. <laughs> I went to see Sarah McLaughlin with a friend of mine, and we went to the show. We got there early. When we got out of the show, the riots already broke, and we're driving downtown towards the San Fernando Valley. Yeah. And the and the city is on fire, and we're like, "That is what scary." Is going on now? You're having flashbacks of Tel Aviv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yikes. Absolutely, it was a, it was yeah. surreal. It so was surreal. I can share a little bit because um, I've got. So my wife and I had not married yet. She had moved from Hawaii, where we were dating and living together, and then she got a job in LA and moved there and lived there for a while. So she was there during all of that stuff. Uh, wow. I can't remember, but somewhere in the valley, you know, just not many stops on the 101 from downtown. I can't remember the neighborhood, but Lake something or other. But anyway, um, so she freaked out. She was like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> and I don't blame her one bit. So, yeah. yeah. She was like, LA definitely had, a tra- had its traumatic moments. You know, I lived oh, through yeah. the 94 earthquake and the Rodney King riots. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, it can of, be a scary place. Colorful history. Yeah, yeah. It can be a scary place. Yeah. So when I lived uh, in LA, um, like around the South Bay area, like um, mm-hmm. near Torrance, mm-hmm. uh, you, you probably have no clue where that is because <laughs> you were in the valley. <laughs> Which LA I know is, what Torrance is. Yeah, yeah. LA is so but LA big. LA is pretty big. Yeah, yeah, LA is so big. But you you may know where it is, but you probably never hung out there, right? Like, no. Correct. <laughs> you just heard of it. Yeah. You drive through it. It's, it's a place that's on the 110 and uh, it's on the way. It's on the. Uh, you pass by it if you need to go to Pedro. That's usually what people think. Or if you need to go to Ikea. 
Oh, right. Right, right, right. Yes, that's <laughs> Which right. Which I did many times. Ikea so. was in uh, Carson, right? Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Not too far. <laughs> Uh-oh. Let's stop now because we're going to stop. Let's start talking about traffic on the 405 and nobody, yeah, yeah, nobody yeah. likes change, that. Change. <laughs> nobody likes yeah, that veer. but people in, in, Let's veer. in L.A. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, all right. Um, I want to get one of these because some of these can be really fun. Some of these okay. past stories. So, uh, what was like, did you get in trouble? And what was the worst thing you ever did when you were a kid to get in trouble? <laughs> Just for fun. Uh, the worst thing that I did is again, get, get in trouble. Or maybe just one funny story. Probably the amount of time um, I kicked my brother. Okay. Wow. Yeah. We we had a a bit of a um, heated childhood between the two of us. And I was not a very kind brother to him. I think I was just very envious of the attention he was getting Uh, because I was the oldest. And he came in to the picture while I was the star. And I think I didn't like that. So sure. There was some resentment going on and, yeah. and we would trigger each other quite a lot, you know, but we also loved each other as, as, as brothers so do. What was your, uh, what, how many years between you and he? There's uh, a little bit over two years between us. Okay. And then we had, an, we have another brother who's 13 years younger than us. Wow. Now that's yeah. a gap. That's more yeah. like a, a nephew than a brother, but okay. <laughs> you know what? In a way, um, I, Feels when, that way. Uh, when Luke, when Luke was, bo- when Luke was born, I was thirteen, and in a way, I feel like um, I kind of raised him. I from mm. from birth, you know, wow. I was with him for so many years, and in a way, I feel like it satisfied my my need to be a dad. Wow! Because kids is yeah. something that I've never wanted or mm. have thought about. It was just not something that I ever thought I was going to do. Right. And, and, but I also feel very satisfied knowing that I had the experience of kind of mm. raising a baby, you know, because yeah, we yeah. were so close as kids and that's cool. You spent the first, you know, decade of his life together in the same house. You so know. my brother and I were three years apart. And, uh, so I would, you were the older brother. I was the younger brother. But when you mm. said that, I was like, aha. I never really thought about it from his perspective. Like I'm the new kid and now everybody's doting on me. Ah, aha. <laughs> now I kind of feel like a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we got over our stuff though. So yeah, yeah. Once we, did we too. yeah, once we got, uh, got to adulthood and we, uh, he actually apologized when we were, uh, at deer camp up in Michigan yeah. together. And he was like, you know, if you're still mad about all that brother stuff, yeah. uh, I'm over it, but I'm sorry. And I was kind of yeah. a jerk to you. And yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm over it. You know, we're grown up now. We can let that go. <laughs> yeah. I needed to do that with my brother as well. And it was, yeah. it was good to clean that up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now we're pretty cool. We don't talk much, but we're pretty cool. <laughs> when I do yeah. see him, we have laughs. Yeah. Okay. So that's not so bad. I mean, fun, not but so not so bad. No. So um, I know you want to talk about you, your stuff, and your sort of like your method. So uh, as an entree into that, I'm going to say, like, I am in a, a situation now where, right, I'm a retired Air Force guy. Uh, I've been doing this thing where I'm saving money, and I think I pretty much have enough, you know, where I don't need to work anymore. Yeah. So... Now I'm in that point of what am I going to do next? And I know I'm going to quit my job pretty soon. It's just a matter of how soon. <laughs> yeah. So I'm definitely in that that next transition space of I don't even know. I mean, I know I want to do something fun and help people. How's that sound? Mm-hmm. And, and then... I don't really give a shit about legacy, to be honest with you. (laughs) Um, I don't know why. I think it's just one of these things where I've got like this spiritual sort of like, um, it's all going to burn anyway. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Whatever we make, you know? Yeah. Uh, It's part of, part of the, I think doing the podcast is a little bit of a legacy project for me. Absolutely. Because it, there's, you know, nearly 300 episodes of me 
trying to be authentic and vulnerable and open and honest and just sharing, you know, and, you know, letting people know that, you know, nobody's perfect, you know, yeah. life isn't the so, highlight reel. <laughs> Go ahead. So what's your biggest question that you're in as it hmm. relates to what you just shared? Um... Well, I, I know I, I'm going to get a little vulnerable here and say the last time I tried to not work, I got lonely and sad. So I'm afraid of that happening again. So that's kind so of in the question? way. I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, I guess is what's next, God? God, yeah, what's a, next? That's a yeah, valid what's, question. What's next, God? <laughs> that's, that's the is, number one question that I hear from every every student that knocks really? on the door. Really? Okay. Is, what's next? I'm. What's next? Yeah. And we find ourselves asking that question in life quite often. You know, we go through phases right. that we we ask ourselves, okay, what's next? And um, oftentimes we 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 already have an idea of what's next. Before we at the at the what's next level uh, sure. stage, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But sometimes we get to a point where we're we are in this liminal space, the space that's, that's in one between. Of my favorite words, liminal. The space of <laughs> the space not between. the uh, the, yep. space, the space between the familiar and the unknown, right? And we we that question comes up again, maybe a, a little too soon than we thought it would. Yeah, maybe. And we find ourselves asking the question, what do I what, what's next? What should I do next? Mm. And I find that that's the wrong question. Good. We ask ourselves <laughs> our own question. Good. And I'll tell you and let, let me tell you why. Okay. Least, <clears throat> we're so used to doing. We're so used to identifying who we are by what we do. True. So the our way of being in the world is coming out of our way of do, of what we do. So right. I am who I am what I do. Right? right. And when the doing no longer really resonates with our soul and we have no idea what is the doing that's out there next, we we begin to have a bit of an identity crisis. Yes. Yeah, you know, yeah. of who am I, right? Who am I if so, I'm not doing x? Right. Exactly. Right. So rather than rather than being the question of what should I do next? What's next? Sit with a different question for a while and see what comes up for you. And the question is, mm. who do I want to become? Ooh. Who do I? I'm writing this down. So everybody Good. pause. Write this down. <laughs> who do I? <laughs> who do I want to become? To become. I like that question. And let that question lead the way. I because like the Sit doing, that, right? Well, absolutely. It's mm. not an easy question to answer, right? <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> uh, this is what my school was was, was founded on. This question: <laughs> Who I do I want it. to become? Yeah, yeah. And and the, the process that we we take people through is a process of returning home to who they truly are in their essence. Okay. So that they are aligned and uh, and self aware enough. Right. To be able to bring their whatever it is that they want to bring out into the world, it's coming from a different place now. Yeah, yeah. It's coming from a place of being. Right. It's not coming from a place of um, need, needing to prove right. something. Right. You don't know? need money. It's something that right. is. Don't it's need- something that's feeding. Their soul is feeding it, and it's feeding it so their soul. Mm. Ooh, that's nice. That's a virtual cycle there. I like that. Yeah. And the only way we can really um, begin to understand this question or even begin to recognize the answers to it is if we stay still for a while. And yeah. that, my yeah. friend, is the hardest part. That's true. You're right. Is the stillness. And you, you've, you have just mentioned that you don't want to be doing nothing because then you get sad and bored. Right. Well, I think yeah. I'm, ref- I'm paraphrasing, but you no, said no, no. something. I did. Similar. I did. You're right. You're right. I, for me, um, yeah, I think there's a there's a fear around like physical uh, isolation, right? Because I was there. 
right? Of where you get up in the morning and you don't have a place to go every day. Um, that wears on you, you know? So it can, I, I, it can. So I am very aware of that and that I need, you know, I don't know what to even call it, <laughs> you know what to call it, but a calling, uh, a reason to get out of the bed, uh, a reason to get out of bed that does feed my soul, you know? And I want there to be people around that are awesome, like you. <laughs> right? And when you don't, you know, when it, I don't even know if I, you know, because I don't necessarily care about the job or the money. It's just I don't want to be physically alone. There's not many places to go, right? Yeah. I think there was another, t- Tim Ferriss talked about this, right? It's like when you are first not having a job, um, and maybe my wife is still working, right? You think, okay, where can I go where there are people that I don't necessarily need to, you know, hang out, right, with them? I don't need to be with them. I just want to be around them. Does that make any sense, right? Starbucks, not the answer. (laughs) It's more like a library vibe. Mm -hmm. Uh, A library vibe, if that makes sense. Anyway. So I digress. So anyway, okay. I think who do I want to become? I'm going to start sitting with that. I like that. So I can start sort of like, it's almost like creating a new ego almost. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to make a new me that I can wear for the rest of my life. (laughs) Well, It's not so much of creating an ego. It's more about connecting to your essence. Okay. Talk a little bit more about what you think that like, like the ego is a construct that we develop. It's not who we really are. Right. I agree. Yes. And the ego has fixations that become our personality. right? Right. Right. So we absolutely can change the personality and change the way that I present myself to the world. Right. But is that really me? No, no. Exactly. Right. So who am I is a really hard question to answer. And the only way that we can do that is if we go inward. Yes. And ask, peel the layers (laughs) that we've, that we have uh, um, gathered over the years Mm. of the roles that we play, the fears that we carry. Right. And begin to get in touch with our core essence of who we are. Mm. I like that. And for that to happen, we need to be quiet. We need to be able to slow down and begin a contemplative practice. Mm. Yeah. So that we are able to hear what's happening inside versus the loud noises in our head. Mm. We want to start to begin to hear... What is my heart saying? Right. I like that. What does my heart want? Okay. What do I really desire? What are my deepest desires? Start to connect to that question. Listening for that still small voice. Yeah. 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 So talk. It's called still small voice for a reason. (laughs) You have to be quiet to hear it. (laughs) (laughs) So the question is, what does stillness look to you? look like for Jeff, right? Because it looks sure. different for every person. For me, still it's looked like traveling the world for two years and right. you know, unplugging from life, right? right. That was a, a version of stillness, mm-hmm. right? a version of lowering the volume of my life, mm. you know, not having any responsibilities that, I'm, that are part of my day-to-day. That to me was the stillness that I needed, the quiet mm. that I needed. Everybody has a different version of that. Mm. And I think you want to you wanna try to find what does that look like for you. Mm, mm, mm. So, and, and don't be afraid to be there for a while. Don't yeah. hurry. Don't, don't, there's no rush to find out what's next. <laughs> or who do I want to become? I like that. That's, that's a really great question. So let's talk a bit, little bit about like your practice, your stillness practice, or your contemplative so talk yeah. a little bit about what your practice looks like. Well, there's a daily practice and there is a, a big picture overall practice okay. of how I, live my, how I live my life. You know, my daily practice, 
Uh, there's daily meditation. There's journaling that's happening almost almost every day. I've okay. been journaling since I was a kid. So journaling is something that is essential to me mm. to uh, start my day with. Um, I'm also an artist and my paintings mm. are meditative. So mm. I will sit and do a meditative drawing, um, oh, wow. which will take me between 30 to 60 minutes. And that time is it's just a, such a cleanse. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. So, um, now that's a neat capacity. I like that idea. Do you, is you, are you just drawing from images in your mind or are you like using yeah, like a they're subject? graphic black and white shapes that just kind of, I channel them out. They just come out. They're very random and intuitive. Okay. And, um, I love it. the time oh, that awesome. I spend drawing them is the coloring them with a, with a pen ink. Mm. So they almost look like a silk screened print when I'm done. Oh wow. But because I'm painting with a, with a pen and it's very, very slow Okay. It takes about an hour to do, you know, an eight by eight piece. Wow. Yeah. That sounds awesome. So uh, those are my daily meditatives uh, uh, practices, my stillness practices. Sure. Um, actually, I walk as well every day. Mm. I do a morning I love walk walking. and an evening walk. Yeah, yeah. Walking is um, great. I oftentimes don't take any headphones with me. I'll just, mm. I'll just walk. Mm. Um, that to me is an essential part of... My totally. Oh, yeah. Stillness practice. Um, I also have a hot tub, so I soak twice oh, a day. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Being in water. <laughs> Being in water, even if it's just 10 to 15 minutes. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is supporting the, the hotter, stillness the better. practice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So those are kind of the the, the everyday uh, routine-ish type sure. of things that I do to experience stillness in my day. Right. But when I look at my life on a, my, a typical year, for example, um, I, I take about four months off every year. Oh, that's great. For stillness. I don't work. I don't, don't do anything. Basically, I I'm, I'm, enjoy the summer. I okay. travel. I enjoy the summer. I just bum go to around. The beach, I go bum and around, around. Go yeah, get coffee. It's just... Having a tea. summer holiday, you know, like we used to when we were kids. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got to a point in my life and I said, and I said wait a minute, w w why not? Why can't I have a summer holiday? Mm. Well, I, it took me a few years to get to pivot my life and my mm. activities to a point where I can actually do that so that I'm, um, uh, I'm, and I'm able to take four months off. But Do you take four months no, off I, I, all, all together or like a month yeah, here and there? All together. Four months all together. Yeah. Oh, from that's May awesome. To September. Oh, that's yeah. great. I teach from January to May. Okay. I take May to September off and that's September perfect. to January is is when the school is very active. We're enrolling students and we're, you know, kicking up the marketing and getting ready for the school year. Nothing wrong with that. I'm thinking about like that's going to be part of who I become. Who do I want to become? Because Vegas is really hot from May to September. <laughs> so not being in Vegas is going to be like a, a feature. So, yeah, yeah. we've already planned yeah. that one out, my wife and I. Yeah. So she loves yeah. to live on the road as much as possible, too. So, uh, you know, that's why we got the Prius. <laughs> You can spend a lot of time driving and not a lot of gas. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I, I was going to say, like, um, like, do you do, like, a TM meditation or is it a little less formal than that? What is the technique of your meditation practice? Um, well, the meditative drawings is one. Okay. Because it right. really keeps my mind. I like that. Because you're super focused. Right. I'm focused and I'm not, you know, it's, it's mm. almost like it just turns the noise down to silence. Wow. Right. Um, but I will also meditate, which means I'll just sit right and quiet and mm. just listen to my breath. Mm. Um, no particular um, I've started recently doing some breath work as okay. well, which I'm finding, uh, an, um, something to be an amazing addition to my practices. I'm still learning it. It's very new to me. Yeah. But, you know, sitting still is not something that is easy for us to do. You right. Know, we live in a very um, fast, quick culture. Right. Immediate gratification is, is so part of our, 
of our every day. Right. And, you know, sitting down, even if it's for just 10 minutes, mm. just in quiet, mm -hmm. that alone is a great start. Yeah. And it, it was the thing that you said about like when I walk, I don't have headphones. And, you know, I was like, yeah. I know. It's like you're very rare out there, right? If you see other people, everybody else has their headphones. <laughs> it's like uh, our culture has become this, like, we're just constantly seeking the next distraction, I guess. What's the word? What do you, what do you want to put there? I don't... The thing that, you know, yeah, maybe it is a distraction we're, or we're, entertainment. We're addicted to distraction. We're right. addicted to it. There you go. You know, we, yeah. have, a, we have a screen on us all day right we continuously uh, continuously yeah. seeking the next dopamine hit yeah from the next whatever is coming at us right, right? so we're constantly in this hunger mode mm. and that to me is an addiction yeah yeah uh, I, i've recently stopped eating gluten i've went wheat free and okay uh, after many years of knowing that wheat is not good for me and knowing mm. that i probably have a wheat addiction Okay. And because I love bread and everything that's bread is, is in my house. <laughs> you know? But it got to a point that my body is just it started it's not rejecting good for me. it. I knew. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You felt and that. And huh? I decided okay. to make that make that decision. And the withdrawals that I've had mm. the first few weeks. It's hard. This craving that comes up for, for the wheat has been really interesting to to witness. You know? I didn't realize I had this in me until I took it away. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it made right. me wonder why, where, where else, what else in my life do I what have else am I hooked on that, that I don't even know? That I'm hooked on that I don't, that I don't even realize. Yes, right? yeah. And so I decided to stop drinking alcohol as well. As Good for you. Yeah. Not that I'm a big drinker, right? right. I'm a cocktail once a weekend. Okay. That's it. Gotcha. You know, my, uh, and you quit that and, too. And even if, even if it was just like a drink on the weekend, the weekend comes around, it's amazing how the cravings just immediately kicked in. Mm. And I realized that, wow, this is interesting. I'm kind of hooked on a weekend drink. Yeah. Okay. Point taken. It, you're me, not alone. Let me detox that out of me. <laughs> you're not alone. I, I'm yeah. at that point now where um, I I have this love hate relationship. I think with alcohol that most people do, right? And yeah. I'm I'm going through something similar but different. So I I just decided like I got into this rut where every day I would get home from work and have a beer, not like a yeah. not two beers, not three beers, just one, right? Like, okay, let's take the edge off now. I've got lots of time in the day to clear this, right? And then uh, I just started feeling permanently hungover, <laughs> if you know what I mean, right? It's not like I can't get up and go to work. It's not like, but I can feel it. You know, I can feel my body saying, stop, stop. <laughs> so well, good for you for listening. Yeah, right. Good for you for listening. Sometimes that still, sm still small voice yells a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you kind of feel it in the back of your head like, oh, yeah, I don't need another hangover tomorrow. So I have been trying to not drink like on a school night is what I like to call it. So no drinking mm -hmm. on school nights. So Thursday, like yesterday, I had beer. Um, not too many, more than four, maybe four or five. I don't know. But not too much to feel like a horrible person the next day, but just enough to get into party mode. So as we're talking about bad things for us, <laughs> what are your thoughts on marijuana? If you have, oh, I'm a, I'm a, uh, absolute, uh, fan. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I grow my own. It's, it's oh, my medicine. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. 
So can, can can we talk more about that? I said I have questions. Yeah, you pull, you, you're you're getting me. You're. Uh, uh, I have questions. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're getting. You're taking me out of the clo- out of the marijuana closet here. Jeff. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you don't want to talk about it, we don't have to talk about it. No, no, there's nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> I agree. I think it's an incredible, powerful, uh, medicinal. Yes, uh, plant. Herb it's a plant that Mother Nature has created for us. And. and Man, our it brains are it pre-programmed. Has only improved my life, right? And just like any medicine, and it's medicine. Kind of have to know how to use it. Yes. So that it doesn't become addictive. So it doesn't become um, toxic. Right. So one of my major motivations of quitting my job is so I can do CBD and THC. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, on a regular basis. Now yeah. I don't necessarily want to use it like what you're talking about as an intoxicant. But maybe, you know, I I did that before (laughs) way back when, when I was like 17, 18. And before I joined the Air Force, I I went through about a year of, you know, experimental weed use, I'll say. But not enough to know what the hell I was doing. I I can tell this one funny story, though. (laughs) We got up really early and went to a concert about a city an hour away, me and all the buddies, right? And then uh, one, of the, one of the guys that we were hanging out with had an apartment in that city. And I, for one time in my life, actually was carrying the weed myself. That never happened. But that day it did. <laughs> and it was like early in the morning, and I, we were already drinking beer and smoking weed. And I don't know how much weed I had, but I slept the whole damn day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right. That's all I can say is wow. Wow. I woke up a couple hours before the concert, right? Went to the bathroom and then threw up in the bathroom toilet, right? Blah. And felt like horrible garbage. And then I went back and tried to sleep, but couldn't sleep anymore because I was hungover. By the time I got to the concert, I felt great. (laughs) I was ready to party again. So yay weed. That's what I say. You know, Mm. uh, so I I have more weed questions. Okay. So so (laughs) you call the show of room, room, veer. So let's veer. uh, Yeah, let's veer. I have more (laughs) weed questions. So is there such a thing as a hangover when you use weed? It, does is there an after effect or a hangover? Uh, in my own experience, it's all I've always right. I can, uh, speak from. Um, the only time that I have had any type of uh, hangover or symptoms from weed is if I uh, mixed it up with alcohol. Right. So you really you know, if I if it's I had probably a drink an and, alcohol and, and I, hangover. Yeah. Exactly. I have. I have. So not weed alone, personally, right. weed alone, no. Right. No. But I also I'm very intentional about the way I use it. Good. And um, and I think that's really one of the most important things that we we must um, totally be present to is the intention right. Right, that right. we have. Why are we using for the sake of what am I using this? And medicine. I call it medicine. You right. Know, it's not just. It's right. not. It, it's it's a am I doing uh, am I doing this life. medicine to have a party? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Which, if you do it intentionally, that's fine, as long as you take it easy, right? I want to have a good time. I want to laugh a little. If I do this responsibly, I can use this as a party drug, probably. Maybe I know Seth Rogen and uh, maybe Joe Rogan. They both use weed mm-hmm. to work, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember I saw a TV show with Seth Rogen, and he said, you take one hit. Yeah. And you wait about an hour, and you don't eat anything, and then you see what happens, right? So now, mm-hmm. then you see, like, am I sleepy? Am I energized? Where, where am I at, right, after that hour? Yeah. And yeah. don't do anything after that until you start feeling like, so it's not like you just like spend an hour smoking a joint. <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, that I've learned from my experience is that um, cannabis is has a completely different effect on every single person. 
Really? You could have 12 people in the same circle and they can all smoke the same uh, plant and each right. one of them will have a completely different experience because cannabis is also a very intentional plant. It will take on, if you don't bring attention to it, it will, it could, it could uh, have the potential of um, taking you to the wrong, down the wrong road, you know, ah, um, okay. down uh, paranoia, down mm. anxiety, you know, mm. so... Uh, I've heard it's really that. important that if if one, someone decides to use cannabis, and right. again, I'm not a doctor. <clears throat> right. <laughs> Big disclaimers here. <laughs> not encouraging not people to use cannabis. I don't play one on the internet. Right. If if anybody's is is uh, uh, curious about it, um, there's a little bit of experiment experimentation that has to happen to really right. understand right um, how this um, affects you chemically, how mm. it affects you mentally how it affects you spiritually physically mm. and um and if it is the right medicine for you because it's not the right medicine for everyone it is the right medicine for me right but it's not and a lot of something that i um uh, not something that i you know <laughs> uh, take for granted or right. abuse right 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 yeah. So let me ask you one more weed question and then we'll move on. We're getting ready to wrap up. So don't let me uh, forget to ask you about the two years off to travel the world. Okay. All right. One last weed question. Uh, one last weed question. Is it safe to say like that I could replace my alcohol habit safely and effectively with weed? Or is that, am I asking too much of weed from a, a completely different medicine? I'm not sure I understand your question. So I don't want to drink alcohol anymore, and I'm hoping okay. weed can be my party slash sleep slash medicine, right? Is that a well, fair? Is that cannabis a fair is really ask? not. I I wouldn't call cannabis a party. Okay. Drug. See, there you go. It can be if that's the intention you want to bring to it. Okay. Right. Right. Um, whether you want to replace it or not is always your choice. Sure. Um, again, it's all about the intention. What's your intention? Understood. Uh, if you feel that alcohol is something that um, is no longer healthy for you, even right. though you like the feeling it gives you, but your body's telling you stop, mm. then listen to your body. Right. And perhaps before you, um, before you go down the, the road of trying other things, maybe get just completely sober for a while. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Plans, detox, you know, yeah, go totally. 100 days. Like, right. With, and, and, and then... Then you're clean. From a clear place. Right, you're clean, yeah. Then m make a choice that is in alignment with right. whatever intention it is you want to bring to whatever it is you, you want to do. Gotcha. You know. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else at, said that to me. Just exactly what you said. It's like marijuana is not booze. Booze is not marijuana. They're not, mm -hmm. they're not even in the same planet. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That you answered no, my question is a, is without understanding it. <laughs> it's a sacred plant is what it is. Oh. And, and I think we oftentimes mm -hmm. forget that mm -hmm. it has healing energies and that it is a, something that needs to be used in a intentional and sometimes a ceremonial way. Sure. So, Set and setting um, sort of situation. Yeah. And that's, that's my relationship with it. Understood. And so, um, so you put it in a sacred space for you. Absolutely. Understood. Absolutely. I, I like that. That's really good advice. <laughs> so let's talk about this time when you took two years off Yeah. and you traveled the world. So what was that? Yeah. What came before it and then how did it come to be and what was it like? What came before it was, um, death and divorce. <laughs> Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. It was a uh, quite a period of uh, shift and change in my life. Uh, I ended an eighteen-year uh, marriage, um, a fifteen-year relationship with uh, a very close friend, um, and my my cat has uh, died. So um, That's a I big found fear. myself. Yeah, it was it was quite a traumatic experience in many ways. Um, I found myself at really rock bottom, really rock bottom from the grief and from the sadness and, mm. 
one of the things that uh, that I mean, I didn't even know what to do, where to go next. Mm. Um, I was in that very much a liminal space of I have no idea what to do with my life from this point on. Um, it was quite a uh, depre- depressed time, and mm. uh, <clears throat> I remember going to a meet to, to a meeting with my spiritual director and sharing with him. Um, where I was, how lost I felt, and I didn't know where I wanted to go next, and um, how defeated and depleted I felt. And he said to me, well, you do have one another choice. And I said, what is that choice? And he said, well, you could pretty much just put your stuff in storage and go travel. And f- when he said that, that was the first time in months that I felt like something felt like, yep, that's right. My, my whole body said yes to that. A whole it was body, Without yes. a doubt, I needed to do that. So, wow. um, yeah, I, I sold my house. I pretty much got rid of 80% of my belongings. It was quite liberating, actually. Mm. And um, packed one suitcase and a backpack and got in my car and uh, started driving. And initially decided to kind of see the country, spend a month here, spend a month there, and just get a sense of what it's like to be in different places in the States. And my first stop was Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, <laughs> Strangely as it, enough. As it may be. Yeah, I, was, I had friends here who lived here who invited yeah. me for uh, to stay with them for a bit. So That's great. I got a bit of a taste of the energy of this place and um, stayed here for about three months. But then kept moving around the country, going to uh, retreats and seminars and just camping and you name it. I, it was a bit of an adventure yeah. uh, until I started feeling a little um, itchy to go abroad. So um, about nice. six months into into the time off, I, I, I went abroad. And just to say, I did not actually set out to be to take two years off. I just thought when I'll, I'll run out of money okay. and when I'll... And, and, and I'll know, I'll know and I'll know, you know, mm-hmm. and a year and a half into it, I ran out of money, <laughs> but <laughs> I wasn't done. <laughs> okay. So, uh, um, you had to make some money. Yeah. So I, I lived <laughs> on my credit card for six months. Oh, because gotcha. Okay. I, I, I didn't want to disrupt the experience because of financial reasons. And Good I know you. myself to be a responsible person with money. I knew I would pay it back eventually. Sure. sure, sure. I said, okay, I'm just going to continue and allow MasterCard to finance the rest of this trip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was really the kind of experience where oh, wow. I needed to just live in the moment and live from free spirit and not actually be tied to any place. Mm. And I had no idea sometimes what country I'm going to be in in the following week or the following month because mm. I just kind of went with the flow, yeah. uh, said that yes to opportunities, awesome. right. said yes to invitations, mm. and um, had an amazing, amazing experience along the way, which now as I look back, you know, it's been five years since I've had, since I've had those two years away. Um. Where I am today in my life, open parentheses, the happiest place I've ever been, close parentheses, gotcha. is a result of those two years. Because what happened in those two years is I really got to know who I am. Mm. I really got to know who I am. For those two years, I traveled solo. Right. Um, without an audience, meaning no social media, no posting where I'm at, no right. look at me, I'm in Fiji or... Delhi or whatever I was. Right. It was just you. a period of me, myself, and I. Mm. And trying to get to know you. <clears throat> you trying to get and to know me. And let me tell you, you yeah. that, that loneliness that you described that is so scary. Yeah. Man, I lived in it for years and for months and on, on months. And it was an uncomfortable place it many is. times. Yeah. But it also was the exact place I needed to be in mm. order to get in touch what I needed to get in touch to with. Mm. And the sadness and the grief that was uncomfortable to be with needed healing. Mm. It needed to be processed. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that I could just, you know, stuff those emotions away and just pretend everything's okay and go on with my life. Those emotions that get stuck in your body. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. You can start. So it, it was a, a process yeah. of, of, uh, an unfolding from day to day of meeting myself in new places. And I, I can't recommend it enough that whatever it is that you're going through, especially for you, Jeff, that you're talking about this in between space that you're right. in of the what's next. Uh, I can't put enough value of just slowing down, just doing nothing for a while. Mm. And and learning awesome. to be okay with that, not running away from the discomfort of of uh, the unknown, right? You know, just because that's where the treasures are. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that. That's that's yeah, where the change happens. We're all getting we're all getting killing ourselves slowly, trying to be too comfortable. I think uh, comfort is killing us. Yeah, me included. In a way, it is. Yeah, it is. In a way, it is. Yeah, I. I yeah, my theme for this year is the year of discomfort. Ooh. I've chosen that as the main <laughs> main theme for the year. I choose that's, a theme for the year every year. That's and, a good in theme. January. Yeah. It kind of uh, is 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 what I measure my my choices around. And mm. discomfort yeah. was really important for me because I I knew that there's growth that I want to step into. And rather than choosing growth as the theme, I chose discomfort because I knew if I make choices that are not comfortable for me to be in, personal, professional, especially in the professional realm, right? Um, growth will happen out of that. It kind of has to, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, you're using your environment, psychological, physical, everything to, yeah, yeah. definitely. That's awesome. Well, thank you. So talk, as we wrap up, talk a little bit more yeah. about the School of Creative High Growth and how folks can get in touch with you and check out your stuff. Thank you. The School of Creative High Growth uh, is, is designed to help people who are in a crossroad. A veer space. Who, yeah helps them kind of figure out what's next, but also helps them figure out who they really are. Mm. And we, we do it through an intensive that takes 100 days. It happens once a year, every wow. January. Mm. It's called 100 Days of Creative High Growth. And it's 100 sessions with me in 100 days. That's a lot. It's, it's, <laughs> that's a lot. That it's is, a lot. That's intense. And it, I like is, it. it is intense. Um, our, our methods are unconventional. Our tools are writing, art, and music. Mm. Uh, it is a um, soul-opening process and a creative, creativity, creative, a creative adventure uh, okay. at the same time. Uh, we go on this, on this journey uh, as a cohort, and um, it's my life's work, those 100 days. I'm mm. devoted to my students during that time. We... Some of my students have said that, oh, it's like it's like getting 15 years of therapy in 100 days. <laughs> and, <laughs> I bet. Oh, man, that sounds amazing. And and bless them for, for showing up mm. because it takes a really specially committed person to themselves and to their growth to say, yes, I'm going to meet myself every day for at least an hour to an hour and a half to do this deep inner work, to continue peeling the layers that are getting in the way of me living from a soul for soulful place mm. and and kind of figuring who the freak I am for once and for all. <laughs> you can you, you know? can say the F bum if you want. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you, you don't have to ask you, you that don't before have the show. To, you, but you can if you want. <laughs> Figure out who the fuck I am. There yeah, you go. Exactly. <laughs> um, it's an it's an important so, question. Um, the process happens every January. Uh, we're recording this in, in twenty two the next one starts in January uh, 27th of 2023. Nice. Um, our enrollment will start in November. If anyone's interested in learning about this work and learning about this course, they can go to creativehighgrowth.com. Um, that website describes the journey uh, quite in detail. Mm. Um, and they can sign up to the newsletter on the website. And um, if they sign up on the, uh, through the newsletter, they'll receive 
a sample session of what it's like to be inside of the process, inside of the inside of the work. So mm. um, it gives you kind of like a taste of what it's like to be in that space. Right. Um, so it's it's pretty. Uh, I feel pretty lucky, and pretty blessed to be able to do this work in the world. Mm. It's taken me almost twenty years to get to a point where where I'm able to share everything that I've learned and all the lessons that I've learned and all the wisdom that I've gained from my teachers mm. um, and put it out there and uh, heal the world, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this has been awesome. And if your uh, school is anything like this last hour, I think uh, anybody that signs up is is in for a... I want to call it a treat, <laughs> but it won't feel that way every day. <laughs> right? They'll be in for an adventure. Adventure. That's for sure. Adventure. Yes. Absolutely. But hanging out with you for this hour has definitely 100% been a treat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. It has been. Yes. This is great. I love your energy. Thank you for the work you do in the world. And thank you for uh, keeping this show. The people you bring on are uh, change agents. Yeah. Each one. I was really impressed with the caliber of guests that you have. Thank so you. Thank you for, uh, for putting this out into the world. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words and uh, thank you for the hour. So uh, you have a great day. Take care. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double E R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer. Vroom Vroom Veer.